All right. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's Abdul Karim here again, or Leslie, doing another video. Uh, this time I didn't forget to switch off the fan, so the background noise shouldn't be so bad like last time. I guess you get good bit by bit making these videos. Anyway, the topic for today, I thought I would talk a little bit about my book that I have been trying to put together out of several papers that I have written before and uh, two additional ones, you might say. Uh, the whole idea occurred to me once I was sitting down and it, uh, I realized that uh, a number of my papers were basically uh, centering on a common theme, a theme that I have been interested in for years, since my days in uh, political philosophy at the University of Toronto with Alan Bloom and Clifford Orvin and Thomas Pangle. You know, these guys, they all show, uh, I, I mean, we were always into this question of the relationship between reason and revelation. Uh, I mean, what is the right way to, to integrate these two um, sources of enlightenment, if you like? There are basically two schools of thought on this. One school of thought simply says they cannot be integrated and that you have to choose to be one or the other. Either you're going to be an intellectual or a believer, but you cannot be both. Um, that's actually the school of thought that uh, my former colleagues, I, I believe, are still subscribing to. I have since kind of moved away from that and I've come to the conclusion over the decades, if you like, that uh, some kind of a synthesis or integration of reason and revelation is not only possible but desirable. And I have myself been uh, trying to, uh, you know, come up with that kind of an integration course in my life and also in my writing. What triggered it originally was some friend uh, back in Toronto in Canada tipped me off and said, you know, Hegel was not like that. And I said, what do you mean like that? Well, he didn't believe that there was, a, there was an incompatibility between reason and revelation. He actually believed that the two could be combined and reconciled. And in fact, he tried to do that in some of his own writings. So I said, what writings was that? And he said, well, uh, it was the Berlin Lectures on the Philosophy of Religion and other writings. So I went in and took a class with Professor Kenneth Schmitz, who was the Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at the University of Toronto. And lo and behold, he happened to be teaching a course on Hegel. And in it, he was also, and in it, he was teaching the uh, Berlin Lectures on the Philosophy of Religion. So that's kind of what got me started. And I read some other works, uh, you know, by Hegel on a subject, such as the positivity of the Christian religion, in which he tried to, um, you know, uh, free the original teaching of Isa alayhi salam from anything else that was added on later on. And these additional elements uh, that were added on later on, Hegel called the positive aspects of the religion. But anyway, that's not what I really want to talk about. I just wanted to mention how I came to this view that, um, you know, there is no uh, reason to believe in this uh, disjunction between reason and revelation, as we have been taught, uh, because we are, to some extent, at least in the Western world, children of the Enlightenment. And it was the Enlightenment thinkers who actually postulated this dichotomy between reason and revelation. I think they did it partly in order to free rationality from what they considered to be the shackles of religion so that they could basically, you know, exercise their free speech and that they could inquire into questions that until then had been either discouraged or prohibited by the church at the time. But anyway, to come back to the book. So I took, found three or four papers uh, in my collection and I coupled them together with another two and I came up with a total of about six papers and I've arranged them into a book. And I've uh, arranged the book uh, to kind of um, indicate that the reason and revelation uh, relationship has not been properly understood either in the West or for that matter uh, in the Islamic world. Although the imbalance, if you like, is much greater in the West than it is, I think, in the East. Because in Islam, uh, the great majority of Muslims, jurists, do agree that reason and revelation are not incompatible, that they can be reconciled, and they are reconcilable. They may disagree to some extent on how this reconciliation is to take place. By the way, these papers I have been referring to are available on ResearchGate and also on Academia. 
under Abdul Karim Abdullah on ResearchGate and under Leslie Terabesi on Academia. So you can read the details in, your, uh, in those papers. Here I just want to outline uh, the basic structure of the book. Of course, I have some information in the introduction about how the tension that we are experiencing currently in the world between, uh, if you like, secularism and uh, Islam, if you want to put it that way. We see this tension, uh, uh, for instance, playing itself out in these um, you know, discordant notes that hear from in a, this, this debate between Iran and the USA as to what, what exactly is going on here why the tension needs to be so great and I outline certain methods in the book in which this tension could be reduced. In other words, where we, uh, the way that the gap between the Islam and secularism could be narrowed. In fact, I have a separate paper on that as well, Islam and secularism, and that one is also available on those two sites uh, on ResearchGate and Academia. So uh, the first Part of the book, the introduction, kind of outlines the, uh, the general themes, uh, the topics that will be touched on, and then I get into the first chapter in which I actually look at the Western world, uh, Western philosophy. It's a kind of a bird's eye view, an overview of the various thinkers that came uh, throughout the Enlightenment and have contributed to this debate, each in their own ways. The main thesis of the paper is that the uh, so-called Enlightenment, the European Enlightenment, was actually a process of freeing uh, rationality or reason from the uh, constraints imposed by religion at first, but later it extended into something bigger and it included eventually also the emancipation of the various desires or passions as we can see in the work of people like uh, Thomas Hobbes, who talked a lot about power, uh, and uh, uh, he was a representative of absolutism. And then we go on to someone like uh, Rousseau, who was really in favor of equality. Then we have John Locke, who was very big on freedom or liberty. And finally, we have uh, you know people like Marx, uh, socialism, and finally uh, Freud into uh, hedonism and finally Nietzsche into creativity. Strictly speaking, Nietzsche was not part of the Enlightenment. He sort of came afterwards. He was a post-Enlightenment thinker, but I think he built on the built on the work of his predecessors so that, for instance, his concept of the will to power is actually a combination of two concepts, neither of which is original with Nietzsche. The concept of will he took from his teacher Schopenhauer, uh, you know, the will to live, the big book by Schopenhauer, and the concept of power, of course, came from uh, Hobbes. And so gluing these two together or welding them together, Nietzsche came up with his own so-called will to power. And I think the clearest expression of the uh, will to power has been the rise of Nazism. And I know that I'm departing now from the academic opinion in the Western universities, which kind of try to excuse Nietzsche of any responsibility for Nazism. But I don't think that is the right thing to do. I think he was, to a certain extent, responsible for the rise of this uh, doctrine because he was the one who postulated the idea of the so-called overman or superman or the ubermensch, as the Nazis used to, uh, you know, talk about the superior Aryan race that they thought they weren't themselves, and all the other inferior people, such as the Slavs and everybody else who was not white, and uh, so they subscribed to this theory of the overman and the underman that was promulgated by Nietzsche and they had their uh, their own interpretation of it and in fact they practically worshipped Nietzsche because uh, Nietzsche's house became a kind of shrine during the reign of the Nazis. The, the Nazis glorified Nietzsche and they considered him to be a great hero and a, a spiritual inspiration for their struggles. So that's basically what I have come up to uh, in my uh, you know analysis of the Western Enlightenment. In other words, I concluded that the so-called enlightenment was not so enlightening after all, that it in fact obscured something, something very important, and that was another kind of light which we can call the light of revelation. Yeah, so that was one enlightenment giving way to another enlightenment. So now with the challenge we are left with is how do we recover that original enlightenment uh, that was uh, propagated and taught by uh, Nabi Isa alayhi salam and later on by Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him, how do we recover this, uh, this enlightenment from under the, the uh, various ideologies that have been heaped up on top of it, so to speak, and made it uh, kind of less accessible than before, 
And uh, these ideologies, in a way, uh, you know, uh, kind of veiled this original enlightenment from us. And I like to use two expressions to refer to this, this obscuring, if you like. One is the veiling of the uh, original enlightenment, or another one is the eclipse of the original enlightenment. So now I use the, I use the uh, term eclipse derib uh, deliberately because uh, an eclipse takes place when the moon, let's say, uh, gets in front of the sun and obscures some of the light. So it doesn't block out all of the light, but only some of it. But even that should be a matter of concern. So I think today I will just conclude the little talk about the sort of the Western eclipse, which, as I argue, has happened uh, as a result of the uh, Enlightenment, uh, which uh, replaced, so to speak, one light with another light, the light of uh, revelation with the light of what they considered reason, and which had certain consequences. And the dichotomy between reason and revelation was one of those consequences. And uh, also the secular state itself was one of those consequences where we have come to believe that somehow we have to separate uh, religion and state in order to keep the peace among the people. As we will see later on, uh, this is not necessarily the only way that you can keep the peace between people because as we know in the Islamic civilization in the old days, uh, the Muslims uh, managed to keep the peace among the uh, people of various religions and uh, you know different races. They had their own system. They extended protection to the non-Muslims who had to pay the jizya, but apart from that they were ex you know, excluded from military duty. So there was a formula in the Islamic world uh, also for keeping the peace among the different races and ethnic groups in the realm. And I think that on the whole this formula worked quite well and perhaps even better than under the secular states. Because uh, if I can just end on this note, uh, uh, just to point out that, you know, the biggest uh, disasters in history, as far as I can see, have been perpetrated by secular states, Nazism and Communism. Look at the number of casualties, the number of people died as a result of the clash between these two ideologies. World War II alone had casualties in the neighborhood of 55 million dead people. The Stalinist purchase also cost between 20 and 30 million people. You know, these were very brutal regimes. So I don't think we can compare them at all to some of these excesses that may have been committed, you know, in, uh, in, in the history of Islam. It's not comparable at all. So we need to keep this in mind and keep also to keep in mind that as Muslims, you know, we all share the so-called, uh, the taqwa, you know, the, the, the fear of Allah. And if you have, I think, the fear of Allah, you will think twice before you commit a crime because you know that you will be held accountable for it on the Day of Judgment and therefore you will be much more careful in how you deal with people because you know that in future on the Day of Judgment all this will come back to haunt you if you committed any bad things. So you better be on your best behavior at all times so that you do not have to have any big regrets later on. So I think uh, I would like to finish on that note and I hope the video is not too long. I'm, I'm trying to keep it short. And uh, if you have any questions, maybe you can put them down in, uh, in the uh, comments section. And if I can, I will be happy to answer them. And until then, uh, I think that's all for today. Thank you for your attention and have a nice day. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.